Alexander, you have to make a white rum. And I was like, I was scared. We're little guys, you know, going after the big guys with big budgets trying to launch a white rum. And after a few long nights, you know, of uh, drinking, I, I, I got caught in the game and I said, well, what a guy like us, you know, the team at Ferran and Plantation can bring to white rum. Was really what we talked about until now, trying to bring back the taste to white rum. Because it's not because it's white that it, has, it should have no taste. I, I just want to write a little history about white rum, by the way. It's just so you know, some countries that do white rums, like Dominican Republic, for example, Venezuela, and so on, rum has to be aged two years. So when you want to do a white rum, then you have to filter it. And charcoal filtration, I'm not totally fond of charcoal filtration. I have proven that charcoal filtration sometimes, usually, strips down rum, not back to an unaged rum, but back to the skeleton of that same rum. And I've proven that technically several times. But you, know, you have to know that a lot of these countries were usually doing white rum, and then the companies got bigger. And there's always a bigger guy, the biggest company that passed the law that says any rum called rum should have two years. Because the smaller company couldn't finance two years of aging, then suddenly, you know, all these guys couldn't call it wrong anymore about Aguadiente. And these guys didn't have any market anymore, and one guy is left standing because he can't afford two years of aging and then turn it down by filtering. I just thought I could throw that in as an information because that describes a lot of elements of taste, you know, um, uh, about what we're tasting. So just to go back to what we, we, we tried to do was. You know, on the white rum, the way I've looked at it, you either had the super stripped down white rum we talked about, or rum agricole, which is very interesting, but on the grassy notch. And I said, how can we build a rum that's got structure, texture, and taste? And I trained as a master blender, you know, when, when, when you, it's a natural thing to say, the beautiful thing is that blending, using different islands, the culture of different islands that I've studied all these years, to try to put together a beautiful white rum. In the first one, you have a Barbados uh, um, unaged rum that's a blend of uh, a common with a little bit of pot. And so this can be on the top left of your selection in front of you. Yeah, sorry for the tasting mats, it's just been a right on time. <laughs> but we'll do it like that. So that's one of the elements. What we wanted to do here is to deconstruct the, uh, uh, the tree star plantation and show you the key elements that we use to blend. Once again, it's not like a recipe we came in the way because it's every time a little bit different, but just to show the base ingredients that we're working with. So that's the number one element. If you want to jump to the second one, we use a, a, a common still from Trinidad. Trinidad doesn't have any pot still anymore, about 15 years ago, they, they, you know, but it's a wonderful distillery that understands very well uh, uh, the use of American oak. And I thought there were some vanilla notes uh, from American oak that were very interesting. So we decided to use that rum. It's aged a little bit, and that keeps you very interesting uh, elements of aging. Now we, we, we developed a way of filtering the tannins out of rum, because I, I'm trying to understand what do we mean by white rum. I think we mean a rum, the way I look at it, we taste without the tannins, without the heaviness of the tannins. This is what I'm looking for. So here, we have one that is benefiting from the aging, but of course we took the tannins out, and that's the second one. The third one is a good old Jamaican rum, as you can see from the nose right away, even if you mixed it up, you know, from, uh, you know, from the glasses in front of you, you can see that there's always, uh, you know, that always adds a nice little note to work with the, the Jamaican. And basically we were done when we were done with these three ingredients, and the last minute we were missing a lot of things, so we threw back in, and age Jamaican, just a few percent, two percent, and in the blend to just give it that little twist. And that's the fourth glass to your right. That's an aged Jamaican that's thrown in back into the blend to add that heavier textured notes in a subtle way. So that's how Plantation Tree Stars was built, uh, you know, by blending uh, these three different islands for what I thought they brought in in terms of taste elements throughout their culture, their terroir. You are the one who is saying, Alexander, you have to make a pineapple rum. Remember, this, this one, I think you will agree with this. And, and, and I was like, hey, you don't need me to throw uh, flavors into a Euro spirits. And he's like, Alexander, you know, that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> I said, well, you don't need me to cut up a piece of pineapples and throw it into a pineapple rum. Well, I didn't have the barrels of rum. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and then he started sending me some recipes, and some of you know me well, a little bit uh, insomniac, so I write in cognac, I read all these different things, until one came home to me, where, you know, there's a haha moment sometimes, it's usually later than I'm going, and I'm reading this very old recipe from a patent book that, uh, that David has sent, where the guys are using the skin of the pineapple. And that was, that was the trigger in my mind, because then everything like a domino, domino play starts to, ah, that should be fun. So guess what we do next morning? <laughs> my yeah, team, you know, including one guy who almost resigned at Ferrand, you know. He, <laughs> he, he, he gave up his family, his true story, his family estate, those estate, he was fighting with his cousins, and he's in Grand Champagne, and he comes to me and says, I'm just sick of this guy, I want to, I'm going to sell my steak, we're going to make hot champagne cognac the rest of our lives with the Afghan cognac. And you know, when somebody gives hundreds of years of this history, I'm like, okay, I'm going to come work with us. And three years, three, three weeks into the job, he climbs up the stairs, goes to my office, and says, I thought I was going to make hot champagne for the rest of my life, and I'm peeling pineapples. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, this is, to him, was like the sky fell on his head. It's like, I think I joined a madhouse. <laughs> Probably did actually. So, so because for three months we ate pineapple for breakfast every morning. That's you know, the way we all work. At it. Because, and I discovered there's many, many different types of pineapples. So the work, the work with, with this was this: it's just throwing this challenge, and I love technical challenges, and you know to just say how we can build this. And there's pineapple and pineapple, and we. We had to find the right one. And really, the secret I think triggered the mom moment was just to say, yes, we're going to use the flesh of the pineapple, but we're going to distill the skin of the pineapple. And that's the idea. And that's one of the few r recipes that I thought were very interesting. In that case, they were fermenting also some of the skins. And I didn't find any uh, good results in fermenting skins of pineapples. Maybe we should try again. But really, infusing the skins into, in that case, the tree star, the white one, and distilling this uh, once. In a, a pot still, a shop in pot still, you get to track a lot of essential oils and flavors. If you want to put your nose on the number five in the middle, that's the latest distill of the skins of a Victoria pineapple. We try, we use very little of this, by the way. We use just seven percent. Very deeply, as a spirit producer, is that, and I say that quite often, is that it's for us to play the instruments that you guys play be behind the bar. And sometimes inspiration comes by somebody coming and visiting us and throwing a curveball at us. And there's these little things that are inspirational, and yet they come, yes, they come from the past, and I know that's important, but I like what Jeff you were saying, uh, you know, yesterday it's also, there's the past, but there's also the future, it's also what we learn. Every day we learn things. You know, we, we have to study a lot of what is called wood management. Uh, you know, it's uh, at least 20 years. You can say cognac and how you use wood. And remember what Jeff, uh, Jeff was saying when you're done with this, you think you know everything about oak and then what about vacation? What about mulberry? What about wild cherry? All these were used in the past. Should we revisit them? And of course, we did this. And, and that's something that you learn a lot. So it's the more you know, the more you know you don't know, right? All these doors open one after the other. And that's really, that's really a wonderful thing. And in the end, it's with great guys behind the bar and people who are like good friends sharing a good moment that we have in mind. So this is all these curveballs we sometimes get or we receive that are very inspirational. They, can, they may come from the past, but they may come from somebody who really has a vision or is just dreaming something up. That's, that's, I think, very important. And the work on woods we're talking about, Jeff, is super important. And I can talk to you about that.